Good evening. It's great to see you all here tonight. My name is Christy Ballier, Undergraduate Programs Chair here at SciArc, along with Marceline Gao. And tonight is my pleasure to introduce Victoria Camblin, writer, editor, curator, and multifaceted cultural organizer, design advocate, and public programmer. The lecture tonight is titled Monumental Luxuries. I understand it will be an experimental lecture that proposes a redefinition of these terms. As she does in her many roles, she will guide us through many probably busy intersections, namely commerce, consumption, and culture. But before we dive in, I will offer a bit of background and then a bit of insight. Victoria attended Columbia University, receiving a dual Bachelor of Arts degree in philosophy and art history. She then went on to complete a doctorate at the University of Cambridge. Victoria understands architects, is admired by them, and circles with ease among them, in part because she has the knowledge and curiosity paired with the critical distance. This value combination, I think many fields and disciplines could say of her. Today, Victoria is currently the editor at large at 032C, a Berlin-based magazine and media and fashion brand. Based on my observation, among other things, it is one of the thickest and densest cultural publications in print today, which I think is saying a lot. In addition, she recently co-founded Magazine Capital, a research and content studio run in partnership with designer, architectural historian, and writer Nicholas Corady. While that was some background, and now for the insight, I will offer three different points of view. First, from a student point of view. An important note about tonight is that Victoria was selected as lecturer this evening by the student union here at SciArc. I was pleased when I learned that the invitation was initiated by the students. I enjoy learning how others encounter figures and then that intrigue them enough to look for opportunities to meet them IRL. The recent issue of 032C was seen recently on one of my students' desks, and when I inquired to them and then others, I heard something like this. We are interested in Victoria Camblin due to the seriousness she gives to every aspect of culture, moving with ease between art, politics, and architecture, always maintaining a tone that does not require a PhD to understand, allowing fans of one sect to come across to come across one that is given equal weight. I think this summarizes her significance and impact on a current generation and many others. The second point of view would be my first encounter. I've never met Victoria until this evening, but I encountered her work in 2016 when I was asked to contribute to a publication coming out of Atlanta, Georgia, Art Papers. Victoria was the editor and art director of Art Papers at that time a nonprofit publication and cultural platform that has been building community and sharing it with the world since the mid-1970s. It was a special issue, 4101. The issue was about Los Angeles, specifically water, and was guest edited by Jennifer Bonner and guest designed by April Griman. For the issue, Jennifer commissioned all women to contribute, 35 total, and April altered the format, changed the paper, and insisted that all interviews used first names instead of last to signify that shift. I sensed Victoria's energy and talent as she set the scene and connected yet another community. In fact, the launch party for that publication was held poolside at the Pink Hotel Motel outside of Los Angeles, notably, an empty pool. And finally, I reached out to a few peers for insight, and it was clear that Victoria is a risk taker and a fierce advocate for design culture. In short, a cultural leader that gives and makes space. So in conclusion, Victoria's research and writing seeks to explore contemporary creative production across the disciplines of art, architecture, media, fashion, and technology. And in the most recent article published that I've come across and read, it was entitled Culture Crisis, Therapies for the Confused. In her words, analyzing and providing solutions for the conflicting value systems and narratives that continue to grip the creative industrial complex. My takeaway or moral from that text was shelve the novel in this fiction section. Let's see what your takeaway will be. 
please help me welcome Victoria to SciArc this evening. Thank you so much for that incredible introduction. I've never been introduced with such insight and thoroughness um, and generosity. Um, and the student comments especially were very moving. Um, and I'm really thrilled to hear that um, my writing doesn't require a PhD to understand. I also have to fact check one thing, um, which is it also does not require a PhD to write. Um, I am actually technically ABD, although I did do <laughs> doctoral work. Um, the, the myth is perpetuated because I refuse to edit my own Wikipedia page on principle. And uh, somebody keeps going in and saying I have more qualifications than I do. Uh, <laughs> so it's this real conflict, as you said, a busy intersection <laughs> of values um, and methodologies is just in that alone. Um, but anyway, I'm just very, very thrilled to be here and thrilled to be invited, uh, especially by the student body, and also thrilled to hear that um, my work with 032C and with Nicholas Carodi um, in the form of this dossier um, is circulating around campus, that's excellent. Um, and I'm gonna show you some content from that today. Um, it had been my desire or my impulse to sort of arrive with this fully formed new thesis and test it out on you guys. And what I realized when I began doing that was that I had to go back um, through some of my work to figure out why I was interested in this topic in the first place in order to better um, sort of evolve that thesis. So what you're going to see tonight is sort of a review of uh, a number of themes that I've approached in my editorial work primarily um, and as a writer. Um, and also then I'm going to sort of segue into the newer stuff that I want to talk about and that I'm hoping will provoke questions or comments at the end that will in turn inform uh, what I hope will eventually be a series of essays on the category or the, the notion of luxury and how we narrate it and how we use uh, what everyone in this room does, uh, creative practices and design practices um, to narrate what luxury is and what happens if we take it out of that definition and shake things up a little bit. Uh, so getting right into it. Um, as, as, as mentioned, my background is in magazines, mostly avant-garde ones. Um, experimental periodicals were also the subject of my graduate research, which was in the history of art, but focused on magazines edited by the French philosopher Georges Bataille. Um, his work will come into play a little later on, specifically his magazines from the interwar period, so late 20s through the 1930s, and also his economic theories following the war. Um, specifically published as The Accursed Share, which offers a theory of expenditure that confronts the insane destruction that had just occurred in the years prior and really prefaces some of the conversations we're having now and have been having in recent years uh, addressing climate and energy crises from an economic approach that deals very much with notions of what we would call luxury or, or excess. So when I um, began making magazines, officially right after college, I've, I had just moved to Berlin and found myself working for 032C. Here's a splice of its first issue when it was still on newsprint. Um, it was at the time I joined, a little later than this, this is 2001, uh, it was still a very small semi-annual publication covering art, architecture, media, and fashion with a kind of notoriously outsider curiosity, especially with respect to the fashion industry. And from the beginning, it, each issue had a theme. You can see here that the first issue's theme was professionalism. And when, this, the t when I joined the title had started to gain traction. We had just done a massive redesign with a studio based in Cologne called Mike Murray. And we became known for something called the new ugly stretch typefaces, neons where they shouldn't be. This was 07, early 07. Um, a lot of these, a lot of these 
experiments have since sort of entered the vernacular at the time. People were scandalized. Um, and as the magazine expanded in its coverage, as you can see, getting more kind of toward fashion coverage and a sort of glossier aesthetic and getting celebrities on the cover and so on, the thematic approach that dominated the entire issue previously um, became condensed in cover dossiers, uh, which is what we call sort of these 40-page sections at the beginning of the magazine that are devoted to a particular theme. And sometimes that theme is an individual, sometimes it's an institution, sometimes it's a cultural thesis or manifesto, and I'll be showing some examples of those shortly. But first I want to um, go back a bit because um, amid my on and off relationship with 032C between um, 2006 and now, I had several other editorships among them, and certainly most significant to me in terms of my professional development was with Art Papers, as Christy mentioned, and uh, which is a nonprofit based in Atlanta, Georgia, where it was founded by artists in 1976. And I served as editor and artistic director there from 2013 to 2018, making a quarterly magazine and directing public and educational programs. I continued to work thematically, that's just instilled in me now, um, devoting issues to a wide range of cultural topics, from sports to the intersection of art and fashion, to art education, surveillance technology. For example, we did an entire issue devoted to um, the legacy of Philip K. Dick. And what you're seeing here is a special issue called Terminus, which is devoted to transportation infrastructure and its intersection with culture. Um, this was the first in what became a bit of a tradition of guest edited architecture and design themed issues, uh, which also included the issue that Jennifer Bonner guest edited, which I'll also show you a little bit of. Um, so, and, and a huge motif throughout my time at Art Papers was how art and cultural production intersected with the urban plan and the built environment. I realized from the perspective of Atlanta, we weren't going to out for art forum, art forum, or a more traditional critical magazine like that, but we could take on topics that had a more on the ground impact and that might apply to artist communities outside the traditional capitals, but with, throughout the world. Um, so, and the, the Transportation infrastructure was a huge conversation in Atlanta at the time and remains so. It's one of the cities not unlike Los Angeles, which doesn't have much of one <laughs> notoriously. And, um, and at the time, some rather new developments were coming out. So I co-edited this uh, issue with an urban designer named Ryan Gravel, who's written a book in 2016 called Where We Want to Live and who's best known as the originator of the Atlanta Beltline, which is a massive 22 miles transit greenway occupying disused railroads and connecting 45 neighborhoods in a city which is notorious for its, ne its neighborhoods being segregated, separated by freeways, uh, various other um, sort of infrastructural interruptions. So it's sort of the high line, but a more radical, much more ambitious vision. We called the issue Terminus after Atlanta's original name and its role as a railway crossing, and we considered all kinds of transport infra infrastructure. Um, here's a little table of contents with the, this is a promo, very early promo for Uber. Uh, uh, so we looked at the Atlanta airport, which is, I believe, the world's busiest in terms of passenger traffic. Um, mostly through transfers. At the time, Rainer de Graaf, a partner at OMA, was teaching a course on the Atlanta airport at UPenn and positioning it as a kind of platonic ideal of an airport, an Ur airport. So we have an essay, an essay from Rainer. Um, we also looked, of course, at art on public transport. Um, you know, what's it doing there? Uh, <laughs> You have these fabulous sort of jacks in, in these brutalist jacks. I'm, I'm actually quite a fan of everything you see in this spread. Um, this was a particularly Atlanta-focused issue, although we did pan out 
uh, quite a bit. So we also looked at the belt line itself. There you see it's kind of cut off, but you see the sort of general teardrop shape of the of the uh, greenway, or what is now becoming a greenway, and we looked at um, we looked at archetypes for public art installations and decided to propose a, sort of a speculative plan of what it could look like on the Beltline, where it you know wouldn't be as cringe as public art usually is essentially. And we looked at what other cities had done and sort of distilled these archetypes. So um, the environmental problem t solver. Um, as one of the arts, so kind of water management, that type of thing. The playground is a common format. Um, the permanent monument, the temporary sculpture program, and so on, um, to kind of see what the possibilities might be. We also looked at um, solutions and funding structures and so on, and sort of curated an exhibition of public art just in the magazine, not in real life. Some of these projects did kind of get executed in the end, uh, in some version. Uh, so we had a nice little tangible, um, tangible result. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then another, uh, and we also had this um, definition of Uber by Keller Easterling. Uh, definitions are a format that I'm really interested in and that I work a lot with. Um, that's also inspired by Georges Bataille's magazines where um, in the 20s, he had a, a magazine called Documents where they had a critical dictionary at the back and it was sort of a surrealist um, encyclopedia defining key terms to the group at the time in ways that of course didn't really fit what we think of as definitions. So that's a tradition that I've channeled with art papers and also in some of the um, work I'm about to show you with 032C and Magazine Capital. Um, this is another special art and architecture issue that um, was mentioned in the intro. It was guest edited by Jennifer Bonner, who's also spoken here at SciArc, and guest designed by April Grimond, who's a total legend, based here. And um, she was the creative director of a magazine called Wet in the 80s. Uh, the byline for Wet was a magazine of gourmet bathing. So again, we're in kind of this like luxury remit. Um, it looked at, at Los Angeles and specifically its pools as a framework for critical exploration of the city's landscape. The pool, we wrote in the introduction, conjures up many LA knowns, film, case study houses, rooftop parties, rec centers, hotel lobbies, and other watery spaces such as car washes, reservoirs, and of course the LA River. We looked at wet um, and uh, Bear Ballier contributed low volume, which was a speculative proposal for a pool that is both above and in ground, planted, if I recall, in the front yard of the Mack Schindler House. Um, and so we're getting a little closer to home, a little closer to the sci art community here, and also a little bit closer explicitly to this um, topical interest of mine in luxury. The product itself that we made with April um, experimented with the form of the magazine. It was a very tactile object. It was uh, used immersive fold-outs, metallics, the idea of having been to extend the pool thematic into its material support somehow, like you plunge in somehow, um, or it splashes back up at you. Um, and the issue took the dimensions almost of a menu, so it gives a sort of hospitality vibe somehow. And, um, and it was printed on quite heavy pearlescent paper stock. So the, the product, again, was quite luxurious, as much as it was also a vector for criticism. And we were making a lot of, a lot of points about the industry and about, um, about planning, about representation. And we did this on this sort of shiny pink, uh, um, almost, almost accessory-like material. So, uh, and this was in this was in 2017, uh, which was a, a time when we were was, Trump had just come into office. So there was there were a lot of uh, sort of politics circulating that we wanted to confront. Um, just you know, and happened to just find this topic that had a permeability and a and a way of being thought about. Um, that was flexible, but still very much represents the sort of 
aspirational nature of the built environment. So the pool was, was approached in the expanded field as all of these themes, um, I hope, in these works are. Uh, consider it as a place for swimming and a place of particular design requirements, of course, but also as a place for collecting resources, thoughts, image, pooling things. Um, a format, as Jennifer described it, that cuts across social, cultural, and economic differences or flags these differences up such that they might be discussed. So again, the pool is aspirational. It's also communal. <clears throat> Considering it as a luxury doesn't remove its municipal function, for example, or divorce it from the contrasts of accessibility and disparity, fantasy and desire that the pool inhabits. Um, in the late, this, we're in the late 2010s. Um, at this point, I moved back to Berlin and rejoined 032C. And at the moment, the contemporary art world, which was technically art papers milieu, um, was going through, you know, even though we were very promiscuous with how we defined that, um, the art world was going through kind of identity, and it, uh, entering, I would say, an identity crisis where it was reckoning with its own systems and structures. Specifically, art professionals were beginning to take issue with the funding sources of the museums and institutions that their work was appearing in. This conversation has already obviously continued, but this was the beginning. By the end of, by the, end of the 2010s, Jana Peel had resigned from her position as CEO of the Serpentine Galleries, and Nan Golden had led pro protests against the Sackler family at the Guggenheim. Uh, the art world was confronting where its money came from seemingly for the first time, and it was quite horrified by what it saw. Um, which connects to the theme of luxury for me too. And I think this is maybe looking back when I start to think about what it is that, um, that we thought we were doing that somehow existed outside of that commercial reality. Um, these sources of funding are only shocking if you believe certain art forms reside outside of a capitalist economy and the ills that come with it. Um, the imperialism, the inequity, the violence. Of course, art is very much within that system. In fact, one could argue that it, given its value and scarcity, it's the most luxury of all goods. Um, in any event, a lot of wealth is required to sustain its output, and that has been the case for a very long time, centuries, if not longer. So we're way less shocked when we see mountains of capital moving around in other creative disciplines. And I'm thinking specifically fashion and furniture design to a great degree, um, where we've kind of come to terms with those markets and the complicity or kind of compromise that's required of those making creative work within them. Um, the sort of delicate dance of finding ways to embed your agenda into a commercial product is sort of much more honestly approached, I think, in these milieus where the distribution of the creative output is bigger. Um, and in, with art, we managed to kind of cloister ourselves in this, in this fantasy of not being part of a market. Um, and magazines are very, have been very complicit in that. As, as critics, we have maintained that veneer of um, exceptionalism, I would say. And the same applies, obviously, in the architecture and de design fields as well. Um, so when I returned to 032C, the magazine had grown uh, in influence and, as I mentioned, had celebrities on the cover, fully fledged fashion editorials, and luxury advertisers, fashion brands, and so on. Um, and uh, it now it self-describes, I would say very accurately, as a media and fashion brand, whereas previously it was a ma magazine of contemporary culture. And, Again, I was attracted to the directness of that, um, of re-entering a milieu that no one imagined wasn't trying to sell things, and um, as often as and as for as much money as possible. Uh, so I went from a DIY arts nonprofit, which, for the record, is an environment that I deeply miss, um, to albeit also quite DIY, but um, quite a major player in. Um, the luxury industry and what it looked like and sounded like um, at 032C. Um, but despite its kind of glossier turn, uh, 032C remained interested in cultural theory. 
And the first project I worked on with my collaborator, Nicholas Carodi, who is a designer and architectural researcher with whom I now operate Magazine Capital, a research and content studio and consultancy, was a cover dossier for the winter 2019 issue called The Black Hole Catalog. Um, it was initiated by Nicholas and based on his conception of something called the new interior, which was a shorthand, an architectural metaphor for the planetary environment we inhabit today. The house that, as climate activist Greta Thunberg famously said, is on fire, but from which we cannot escape. So we address the psychological repercussions of that fact as an eco-anxiety um, through this interior metaphor. Um, and this was, here you have it, uh, this was right after the first image of a black hole had been released. Um, we used that in place of the famous pale blue dot on the whole earth catalog, um, which is a counterculture magazine published by Stuart Brandt that had its heyday in 1968 uh, to 1972, although it continued to publish occasionally uh, following that. Um, and the dossier appropriated the publication's format to present a criticism of the way ecological divorce evolved out of the community that Whole Earth Catalog ostensibly represented, and um, also uh, the way that ecological discourse was commercialized within it in a very, um, in a way that even though this magazine has become extremely influential, I don't think people really talk about. Um, so Steve Jobs once called the Whole Earth Catalog a Google in paperback form, 35 years before Google came along, idealistic and overflowing with neat tools and great notions. And the ideology Jobs refers to centered ecology, grassroots education, and do-it-yourself self-sufficiency. Um, and the slogan, as you can see, was access to tools, access being provided primarily in the form of catalog ads and product reviews. Um, so it's an extremely product-focused publication, despite its associations with this sort of essentially hippie culture. And Jobs was, in a sense, correct. It did preface the internet in the sense that, like most search engines, it is totally mostly ads, um, not selling directly to consumers, but connecting them to vendors, essentially. Um, and the, this publication has since been embraced by tech communities um, as, the originator, as the originator, not just of, not of a s sustainable lifestyle that it sort of purported, but as the originator of Silicon Valley culture itself. Um, so yes, despite its green philosophy and stated values of accessibility, the catalog was also seemingly in, ignorant of the massive social movements going on at the time, mm -hmm. civil rights movements, anti-war protests, culture crises, and so on. Um, so it's a commercial product that's often seen as a social one. And that is another paradox of luxury, the lamination, as Nicholas tends to put it, of ecology and consumerism in this case. Um, so I've since, oh, I'll give you a little bit more content on this. Um, so we, we inhabited the frameworks of the Whole Earth Catalog, which has an ad sections that just essentially uh, provided phone numbers to suppliers of build your own shovel kits and various things were kind of almost a survivalist mentality. Um, we didn't put phone numbers, we put web addresses. A lot of this content being free, that was one of the ways we kind of subverted um, the, the framework. So, sorry, this is, this is one of the naughtier pages, I apologize. Um, <laughs> I just, okay, and, um, and we also tend to bring in, sorry, we tend to bring in sort of uh, a little comedy cartoon characters, cliches, and so on. Um, and also a big part of the vocabulary we used in this, which we developed much, uh, to a much greater extent in culture crisis, is a therapeutic vocabulary, uh, sort of based in psychoanalysis. Uh, psychoanalysis. The idea being essentially of uh, giving a kind of talk therapy in a milieu, in a media environment where everyone's always giving predictions and instructions. I mean, this is 
this is especially the case now um, with how Instagram has basically become like a self-help advice feed. Um, and we're, we're approaching it a bit more traditionally <laughs> as, um, you know, if you just name the problem, perhaps its grip on you will somehow loosen. Um, as opposed to dogmatic kind of do this, not this type of a, a model, um, which relates to the um, provision of tools in a way. Um, so I've since stepped, I stepped back from 030C, I went at large um, just over a year ago. Uh, so I continue to work with them and have mostly been focusing on magazine capital, but we did create the cover dossier for the most recent issue um, after a number of working titles that were rejected by our editors. <laughs> um, we landed simply on culture crisis and, um, and zeroed in on what we perceive to be a return of traditional values at both ends of the political spectrum. This is also pretty much in, entered discourse already. Um, downtown New York um, art scene kids converting to Catholicism uh, on one hand, and then of course all of the erosion of women's rights and you name it on the other. Um, so we push back on the way that we even narrate return and things being back um, of certain social and cultural phenomenon because of, very often we put a neo or a return in front of things that never went away. Um, this is the leave the novel on the shelf. A lot of the dossier dealt with um, this kind of rejection of narratives of novelty and narratives of newness because they're often seen, they're often used to mask um, persistent realities. Um, you know, neoclassicism was just kind of classicism. Uh, Neo-fascism implies that at some point the world was rid of fascists, which it never was. Um, so we're, we're, we're trying to kind of, um, in general, cultivate more consciousness about the way we talk about things. Um, otherwise, um, we, the, with the, with the, the theory being that we'll, <laughs> the, the dissonances and contradictions that surround us in culture, um, the political expectations uh, versus the, the creative ones and so on will be a little bit easier to tolerate and a little bit less generative of neurosis if we can talk about things and actually um, sort of get behind the meaning of what we're saying. Um, so, that's just one of the critiques of the language we use to describe the contemporary. Um, and again, doubling down on this sort of psychoanalytic approach, um, suggesting that vocabulary is the root of some of how we cope with our issues. Um, not, it's not how we escape the house that's on fire, but uh, it's more, more about um, how, to, how to deal with living in it, to go back to the black hole catalog um, so, yes, yeah, so we, we, we kind of call to replace the vocabulary of marketing um, and novelty, which we call the lie of the new, um, with more analytic terms, um, again, in the hope that by speaking something, it will have a different hold. We divided the dossier much like a self-help book, <laughs> always referencing the media models that we're also kind of trying to take down. Um, into pillars of newness, institutionalism, narrative, and proper language. Um, and as with the Black Hole Catalog, we played, you can see here, this is a riff on Bloomberg Business Week. We called it Values Business. Um, and uh, this is a, a, a riff on the German magazine, uh, Der Spiegel, but of course the red square format is um, ubiquitous Time magazine and Zero Thirty Two C works with it too. Um, GQ, uh, so yeah, kind of riffing on uh, cover formats, the layouts. Um, this three-column layout is sort of a, a nod to vintage Playboy layouts and the way the ads are integrated. Uh, we have a lot of New Yorker-style cartoons. Uh, so yeah, just kind of trying to riff on um, on these kind of media formats. Um, we also even had advertorial content, which is a big part of making fashion magazines right now. This is an actual 
Versace jeans couture paid advertorial that I creative directed while we were working on the on the thing. Um, so the uh, we also insert these morals that are sort of distillations that function as pull quotes uh, throughout this more densely sort of printy sections. Um, and um, just no one's ever asked me where we got these cartoons and stuff, but they're um, they're all mid-journey. <sighs> it's so crazy. I'm like, do you think we hired an illustrator? Um, so, uh, so we, <laughs> uh, just in case no one was going to ask. Um, so, so yeah. So we looked at recent discursive topics in art, architecture, and fashion, and how they're expressed. Sometimes appropriating past coinages for our arguments. For example, we have a read in our institutionalism section of something called the Oedipus, com uh, sorry, Oedipus Complex, which in and of itself is a cannibalization of the Oedipus uh, Complex. Um, and the term was originally used by a stage director and activist named Ben Cervantes to describe Imelda Marcos's compulsion in the 60s and 70s to build massive brutalist culture centers in the Philippines pouring cash into extravagant architectural works of propaganda in order to signify progress, um, despite there being crisis left and right and horrible treatment of um, the citizens. Um, so many artists at the time were not on board with this fanfare, uh, seeing debt crisis looming on the horizon, and projects were often built quickly or stagnated. Um, eventually, the term was expanded uh, to express how buildings are used as a means of imposing power by making a mark on the landscape. And our dossier proposes an even more general deployment to denote any tendency to self-institutionalize or to canonize one's own activities or those of one's social group too grandly or too short-sightedly. So for us, the edifice complex became a diagnosis applying to say, icon-worshipping iconoclasts, or author authoritarians running on a platform of freedom and revolutionary change. Um, and again, this is, comes back to various um, ad-speak promotions to promises of, promises, of, uh, promises of green practices in, in, uh, in production, on production lines that simply cannot be sustainable, and so on. Um, so the uh, the anti-institutionalists' urge to institutionalize, we wrote, tends to result in an inability to do so effectively. Edifices are built upon faulty foundations and present a menace to society. And this bore out quite literally in the Philippines, because um, part of uh, the uh, Marcos's cultural center of the Philippines complex, um, and com the com complex double meaning is not at all lost on us here. Um, that's another architectural metaphor that seamlessly goes into an analytic uh, vocabulary. But uh, part of the part of the um, CCP complex in the Philippines collapsed in 1981. Uh, apparently, there's some mixed data on this, but uh, allegedly burying hundreds of workers in cement. And the event is seen as a harbinger for the end of the Marcos era and also um, kind of starts getting <laughs> at some of the questions posed or put forward in my original talk description, which is what are buildings constructed to house art and culture actually supposed to do and are they safe? Um, so in the, in the same section, right after we go into this, we have um, definition of the luxury industry. And I'll just, I'm just going to read it um, so you can get the tone. Um, although I've, I'm going a little long. But anyway, um, so the luxury market, once fairly small, is now among the biggest sectors in the economy. And LVMH chairman Bernard Arnault has become one of the richest men in the world. How did it happen? The definition of the market itself changed. The products remain expensive, but rarity isn't a critical factor anymore. And they are more widely consumed than ever. People buy designer bags, but cannot afford their rent. We aren't here to moralize. The world is ending. Get your bag. But for the purveyor of these goods, more money brings more problems. If you sell to everyone, you have to handle everyone's moral hang-ups. A campaign ends up on right-wing media because the clothes it, it advertises are sold to right-wing consumers. 
but luxury consum consumers have always leaned conservative. They're rich, after all. The heart of the problem is not the consumer, but the creator. Directors of luxury houses imagine themselves to be members of the cultural avant-garde, ideologues with philosophical vision. We might imagine a conflict there. Artists don't sit well alongside financier, right? Unless, of course, they grew up at the dinner table with them. What we have here isn't just a Nepo baby trend. <clears throat> Google your favorite artists from centuries past, then Google who their parents are. Another way to frame all this churn is to say that the meaning of luxury has changed, or perhaps that it should. A recent Bloomberg article informed us that the art market has surpassed crypto, which is to say things are just as they were before. We're all fatigued by op-eds debating the merits of NFT art because they missed the point. Content matters little when it comes to luxury, which is and always has been about expenditure, not about a particular asset. That excess is a fact of life, not something to adjust your consumption habits to mitigate. When we try to offset all the shit and energy and matter we off-gas into creative production, we're just expending more. When expenditure is the, is the raison d'etre, inhabiting the world of luxury makes a lot more sense and makes all the waste feel a lot less senseless. Denying the nature of luxury is painful and confusing. Seeing expenditure as inevitable hurts a lot less. Um, so that kind of gives you the vibe of um, you know, the tone of the, the work we're doing um, and trying to kind of strike a balance that is um, incisive and research oriented, but not um, preachy. Um, and around the same time we were beginning to discuss the culture crisis dossier, I was invited to give a guest lecture at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, sorry, I, Greta's in the wrong place, but I think she's good here actually. Um, I thought it would be, uh, I thought it would be an interesting opportunity to attempt to coalesce some of these ideas about luxury and to see if I could prove that luxury includes a lot more than we admit and perhaps even shed light on the nature of what that more might be. I wanted to separate the idea or terminology of luxury from its typical usage, using examples that illustrate how we might reapply the notion in an expansive way toward the history of art and architecture, potentially influencing our, our ideas about modernity. A great deal of cultural production has attempted to solve the problem of luxury, to condemn what we imagine to be luxurious in favor of a pragmatic mode of being, or to redeem it and divorce it from a negative view of excess and consumption by embedding luxury product with unparalleled functionality, creating space for it in moderation, or by contrast to the default of the mundane. So a luxury is typically viewed as something that is non-essential, desirable, indulgent, usually expensive in terms of cost or another form of investment, maybe time. It is something that makes for exponential comfort maybe, or in product terms, something that is simply seen as the best version of itself, for example, a luxury edition of a car or a magazine. Um, the luxury industry is basically the industry of expensive non-necessities or expensive iterations of possibly practical things in this sense. Uh, there is an aspirational aspect to it, of course, a desire, but also not infrequently, at least in the modern context, there is a judgment, uh, this, which can be good or bad. This, this creates a kind of hierarchy of consumption which falls into two broad categories. The kind that is necessary, that serves the most essential needs of a body or society, and the kind that is not required, squandering of resources. The latter can include luxury consumption, architectural ornament, unnecessary travel for fashion or art weeks, et cetera. Of course, what falls into a given category shifts around according to the values of a particular community or epoch. For example, how a society views a person's ability to spend money versus how they affirm those who don't. Regardless, a person or community is sort of identified by their excessive expenditures, and I'm paraphrasing Bataille here. Their uh, society is identified by its luxuries uh, and a person or a community, uh, not by how they consume in necessary ways, which are far less varied. And depending on the values of a given group, religious offerings and sacrifices might be excusable expenditures, whereas profane ones might be excluded. A king might be praised for building a cathedral, but scorned for extending his palace. There are, the, there are various tools we use to offset the negative forms of consumption, including actual offsets, but also the funding of art and so on, uh, to redeem our various expenditures. Um, and apparently this usage of luxury goes back quite a way. Um, uh, 
uh, in Latin, it mean, it's a fourth declination noun that meant extravagance, success, debauchery, pomp, and splendor. And it also meant dislocation. And a user I found on Reddit um, and I mentioned this in the Amsterdam talk as well, uh, corroborates that, noting that luxation of the globe is the medical term for your eyeball leaving your socket, its socket. So the idea being perhaps that the very wealthy or those luxuriating are displaced from ordinary life, living outside of it in a world of extravagance. So um, I wanted to make a displacement for luxury itself, um, a separation of luxury from its existing terms, and I wanted to propose a luxury of non-displacement a combination or fusion of luxury and other things typically not categorized as such, to displace it back inside the realm of experience where it could be a tool to go back to the language of the whole Earth catalog, a tool um, for integrating and navigating the contradictions of the world we inhabit, specifically as cultural producers, architects, creatives, designers, however you identify in the room. If you are at all engaged in thinking about sustainability, as I'm sure everyone here is, you must sometimes wonder why are we doing all of this? Why are we putting so much energy and carbon and so on into making these things we make? I certainly have these thoughts as someone who makes magazines um, where there's not even any paper anymore to make them with, but we still find it. <laughs> um, uh, my, my, there's paper, they just make Amazon delivery boxes with it instead of printing paper now. Um, so my idea was that refining luxury might help us navigate this somehow, perhaps counterintu counterintuitively. So I decided I needed, for this lecture, I decided I needed a case study. Um, and I was in Paris at the time and the Bourse de Commerce had just opened, which is a, a a former stock exchange that was renovated by Tadao Ando Architects to house the Pinot Collection, which is the official um, way of referring to the artistic and cultural assets of the French businessman Francois Pinot, who owns Caring, which is the luxury conglomerate that in turn owns Gucci, Bottega Veneta, Balenciaga, and so on. There he is. And I'm gonna speed up through this part, um, which is, which was also an experimental lecture that didn't really reach a hardcore conclusion. Um, but deep dived into the history of the building, um, which has this kind of anachronistic um, column from a Medici palace that was torn down when the aristocratic owners couldn't afford to um, maintain it anymore. They took it to pieces and sold it in bits um, after a one uh, one Italian aristocrat decided to put a stock exchange um, on his lawn. Actually, it was a grain exchange on his lawn and fa the project failed. Um, anyway, they, they registered that as a historical monument and they had to keep it even as the rest of the building was rebuilt. Um, and it used to be for, it's a, a, hor it's a horoscope tower. You used to be able to go up and look at the stars from the top of it. Um, so here's the Tadao Ando renovation. Um, uh, which, interestingly, um, went, when, when they were dis discussing the renovation, the idea was to go back to its construction in 1989, uh, sorry, 1889, um, when it opened on the occasion of the Exposition Universelle, which was like a World's Fair in Paris, basically rebranding the city as, um, as a place of cultural and technological progress. And this building, um, with its dome was very high tech at the time um, and inspired a lot of other stock exchanges to have this dome structure uh, associating the dome somehow with uh, yes, a capitalist success. Um, and there's this horrifying mural um, uh, in the rotunda that they maintained. In fact, they restored. Um, and it's, um, uh, it's described really bizarrely as um, uh, just a fabulous kind of homage to East meets West and so on. But it, what it is is a 360 degree depiction of, of, of imperialism um, in, a, in, its, in a huge growth point. And you kind of go around the world and you can see all the different cultures being oppressed. Um, here we have some meetings uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, colonists and their um, Every, everyone's pretty hospitable in these mirrors, uh, in these frescoes, but um, you, have, you have women being kind of weighted on with palm leaves and stuff. 
Um, so I was quite surprised that this didn't seem to be problematized at all. I mean, I wasn't, I didn't exactly know what they were supposed to do with it, but I knew it was interesting um, uh, because in respecting the fundamental elements of a heritage monument, which now the entire building is, basically just putting art in the building, having a curatorial aspect is curative. Um, just as the restoration work is somehow restorative, it's, it's sort of, you don't need to change or mask a single thing because the mere presence of art or museum status is enough apparently to purge the location of, uh, of, its, of its extremely, extremely violent history. Um, so I found this to be quite a fascinating example of, of, the, way, um, of the way creative practice is used uh, essentially um, not, not just in the service of, of luxury industries and, and expansion, but frankly, in the service of their marketing departments. Um, and so I, uh, this is, I'm gonna skip over, these are just some entrails um, in the former marketplace, which is where the bulls is located. It was trying to emphasize the violent of the scene. Uh, animal butchers used to sell stuff outside too. Um, and, uh, and now as Paris is preparing to host the Olympic Games and generally repositioning itself as a sort of post-Brexit powerhouse, um, all the building facades are being cleaned, public infrastructure improved, sustainability is being foregrounded. Um, the French narrative is that they're leaders in nuclear energy while all of the other countries are digging around <clears throat> in sources of power that probably should have been left in the 1880s as well. Um, and uh, while touching up all of this cultural heritage, they're doubling down on its artistic legacy and luxury industry prowess. Um, and the Bourse de Covelles is just one example of a proliferation of foundations in the French capital that are underwritten by luxury labels, including the Jean Nouvel design Fondation Cartier, and the OMA designed Anticipation Lafayette, which is a, a branch of the Gallery Lafayette department store. Um, and again, it's adopting an image as a green, bikeable, digitally optimized smart metropolis for the 21st century, um, anticipating all of this influx. Um, I'm gonna conclude with another, some more recent theory, courtesy of some Parisian sociologists named Luc Boltanski and Arnaud Esquer, who in, uh, 2018 published a book called The Economy of Enrichment, which describes the advent of capitalism based on tourism, luxury, cultural heritage, and the arts, um, and, and real estate and buildings of, of cultural capital are extremely, extremely important in this matrix. Um, they use Paris as the world's prime tourist de de destination, which I believe it still is, as an example of a larger global phenomenon um, and objects are at the heart of this new economy in which growth is contingent on how we assign value to material things, um, sort of, uh, and, and amassing them is central to the acquisition and expansion of wealth. So agents of the enrichment co economy are creatives and culture makers who in circulating contemporary art, fashion design, real estate, buildings, and so on, participate in capitalist enterprises they might have remained outside of seemingly leaving the capitalism to the industrialists and the fin financiers. And among the paradigms of consumption described in enrichment, which include standard form, asset form, trend form, and the neglected, oh, sorry, the, the neglected collection form is the most powerful, um, they argue, because it's capable of endowing an old, useless, mundane object with new and incredible value by virtue of its ability to tell, tell a story of worth, tradition, Im or immortality. Um, so there's a lot of wealth being accrued in buildings like this. In fact, the, the mural is even becoming more materially valuable as we speak because of the, the acquisition of luxury goods such as art um, uh, happening between its walls. And I'm gonna include the acquisition of sort of sustainability or environmental capital too. Of course, everything is outfitted to be super green and energy efficient. Um, I think they have like a solar powered ice cream maker or something. There's um, the, things like this that kind of also increase the, increase the value of facilities like this um, from, every, from every angle. Um, 
So there's, um, I think, I think I don't, I'd almost like to open it up to a uh, discussion. I, I will say, I suppose what, what I, what I struggle with is sort of where once, once the, the fact of the matter has been spoken that, you know, we're, we're working for this sort of metaphysical marketing department, I describe what do we do with that? Um, and how do we, and how do we, um, how do we maintain and nourish discursive freedom and creative freedom, or if freedom is even a virtue in this, um, in this context, um, in, in, you know, all the while inhabiting these systems, just as we inhabit the house that's on fire, um, that are perhaps, um, you know, more about, about the acquisition of wealth and capital than they are about any type of um, uh, clever solution making or, um, or self-expression or whatever uh, got you into the practice of design. <laughs> um, so and I, I, I was confronted with this last week on a trip to Grand Cayman for work, as you can see. <laughs> with, um, it was on the invitation of a, of a Milan-based experimental architecture group called Space Caviar. Um, and hosted by a resort called Palm Heights. And, um, and uh, the idea, the, the sort of brief was that we would go and develop a curriculum for uh, an experimental school, uh, mo most, mostly, mostly architecture pro professionals. That's Luca from Parasite 2.0, um, Nicholas. Um, and, uh, and essentially, uh, we, we, we got together to hopefully incubate the possibility of this school, which we're calling Thinking Like an Island, um, which was intended to contemplate leisure environments, um, obviously kind of uh, ecological sustainability um, and, and colonial um, tourism, or the decolonial look at tourism, if that's possible. Um, and you know, obviously, treading very lightly politically in these matters, and, and certainly not mentioning anything about um, certain topics uh, because it, it remained sort of a client-facing project. So, um, so here we were in the in the lap of luxury, doing the same things we do every day, like rendering files and v editing videos and word processing and people like everyone had SketchUp open for this um, photo. So, so suddenly it was just like a, I found myself in this very, very exaggerated <laughs> version of what I've been thinking about, which is, you know, how do we make use of these environments and how do we create, in this case, a school, which I haven't even brought into the kind of luxury discourse yet, but I, I certainly will, um, uh, that is, that is, sustainable in every respect um, and critical and and um, and also you know a, a product of of the the luxury milieu that I just argued we inhabit and have to figure out so that is where I'm going to leave it um, thank you